The title of the topic is Do Not Refuse the One Who Is Speaking. That's from Hebrews 12, 25. Hebrews and Contemporary Preaching. It's, not, it's a privilege and a delight to be here at the Henry Center for Theological Understanding. Carl F.H. Henry has been a hero of mine for many years. I grew up under the influence of Billy Graham, Youth for Christ, and Christianity Today. Henry was one of those people who helped me, even as a teenager, to answer the almost daily assaults that came to my Christian faith as, as I was in a very, very secular high school, very secular environment. So imagine my delight when, as a seminarian, I heard that Henry was going to give a series of lectures at Asbury Seminary. At the conclusion of one of those lectures, as we were going out the door, a friend of mine said, Henry slipped up twice and used less than a four-syllable word. And I'll have to admit, I, found, I find Henry, I found him then and even today easier to read than I found him to listen to, listen to at the time. Um, I don't have enough four-syllable words to imitate his style. I have, however, attempted to emulate his commitment to Christ to the trustworthiness and sufficiency of Scripture, to the truth of the gospel, to the need for conversion, to a life of discipleship that engages the world, and to the intellectual defense of the Christian faith. I've always appreciated the way he put fundamentals above sectarian concerns. Thus, I was glad when I read in Christianity Today, by, it was April 2013, in Timothy George's column, that a number of people are beginning again to think that Carl Henry is cool. I'm also very grateful to Dr. McCall, to Jeffrey Fulkerson, and to the officials of the Henry Center for Theological Understanding for their invitation to speak to you today. Thank you so much for having me here. Now our question, what is the question, the topic for today? Today's topic is closely related to Henry's lifelong concern with the integrity and accessibility of divine revelation. Here's the question that is before us. How can we grasp the perennial relevance of the Bible in today's world? That's, of course, a very big question, but we're going to look at it in, from one perspective today. Our thesis is that an examination of Hebrews is theology, Hebrews' use of the Old Testament, can help us answer this question for both Testaments. Of course, every New Testament writer believed in the continuing relevance of God's Old Testament word. The author of Hebrews, however, was a sophisticated theologian, biblical interpreter, and pastor who confidently assumed the, uh, the present and perennial relevance of God's word as the very foundation of his book. Hebrews is a sermon. That is, it is an extended uh, exposition of the word of God for the people of God. Much of the non-evangelical church has dismissed this concern because it has exchanged the sufficiency and the authority of Scripture for a pragmatic or utilitarian approach to biblical interpretation. Those who hold this view deny the unity of Scripture and severely limit its relevance. The Bible cannot continue as an authority in the modern age of scientific and technological um, uh, development. Because it, is, uh, because it was written long ago in diverse cultures, very different from, and even if not expressed, inferior to our own. Sometimes, however, we may find it helpful. Our fathers and mothers have found it, it to be edifying throughout the centuries. Uh, it does record, among other things, the... I can see my manuscript better if I take my glasses off, though I can't see you quite as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compromise here, the manuscript, though I still love you all. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes, however, we may find it helpful. Our fathers and mothers have found it a source of edification throughout the centuries. It does record, among other things, 
the spiritual insights and religious experiences of great people who encountered God, who encountered the divine. So we use it when we find it helpful for our own spiritual development or our own cause, but discard it when we do not. Sometimes people say, you'll hear them say that the church uh, can use the Bible as it sees fit because the Bible is the church's book. Sometimes they also justify their departure from biblical authority by referring to new ways in which the spirit is leading the church. We as evangelicals often begin our discussion of biblical relevance by addressing these same questions of scriptural diversity and historical difference. Moreover, we live in an age that demands immediate relevance. For many people, the most important contemporary question is, what does it mean to me? Thus, we struggle between the pinchers of historical distance and a congregation impatient with anything less than clear, straightforward, immediate application. Sometimes we become paralyzed by staring into the headlights of the text's antiquity. At other times, we make trivial application of Scripture dictated by contra uh, contemporary cultural norms. Now, when we look at Hebrews to see what it would have to say on this subject, we're really shocked when we turn from this tension between historical distance and contemporary application to the world of Hebrews. It's like jumping into a cold pool on a hot summer day. The pastor who wrote this book has no question about the immediate relevance of God's word as revealed in the Old Testament. That word is so intrinsically relevant, intrusively relevant, I mean to say, that it penetrates to the very discerning of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. He is deeply concerned that his hearers do not refuse the one who is speaking. If we read him superficially, his approach may even seem very naive to us. We're, we're going to examine two commonly acknowledged prominent characteristics of Hebrews in our search for the author's secret. First, we will look at the way Hebrews describes God as speaking today the word that he has recorded in the Old Testament text. Then, we will look at Hebrews' focus on the exalted Son of God seated at God's right hand. First characteristic, Hebrews affirms that God still speaks what he has spoken. One of the striking features of Hebrews is the way in which this book consistently introduces Old Testament scripture with present tense verbs of saying, often with God, the Holy Spirit, or Christ as the, as the speaker. Billy Graham is, loves to say, the Bible says, Hebrews introduces Old Testament quotations with God says. There are three important aspects of this introductory formula. First of all, God is, the, is affirmed as the one who speaks Scripture, even when it is not directly attributed to him in the Old Testament text. Second, God speaks, in quotation marks. He speaks Scripture. It is not merely written. He says it to his people. He addresses them in their situation. Finally, he speaks this word in the present. It may have been written long ago, but God speaks it even now. Do not refuse the one who is now speaking. Now, there are two fundamental assumptions uh, that underlie this. The opening verses of Hebrew provide two assumptions, two fundamental assumptions that underlie the immediacy of God's Old Testament word. The continuity of the one who speaks and the continuity of those who hear. The same God who spoke of old in the prophets is now spoken in one who is son and continues to speak. The use of prophets to encompass the entire Old Testament revelation underscores its anticipation of the fulfillment to come in the son. God's son-mediated word maintains continuity with previous revelation by fulfilling it. Second, these verses assert the continuity of the recipients. Those who heard God's word through the prophets were the fathers of we who now hear God's word in the Son. This continuity has been created by the word of God and the response of faith. There's one household of God throughout the ages in which Moses serves as steward and over which Christ rules as son. Those who respond with persevering faith and obedience are part of that household. Now, these two 
fundamental uh, uh, assumptions underlie two conversations. This continuity of speaker and recipient underlies the two conversations of Hebrews. God speaks. He carries on one conversation with his people and another with his son. Of course, there's interface between them. But to start with, we can say there are two conversations. He carries on one conversation in Hebrews with his son and one conversation with his people. The first dominates the, author's, the, the author pastor's uh, exhortation, all, uh, his, all the horatory pa- parts of Hebrews. The second, that is, the conversation with the son, his theological, that is, Christological exposition and discussion. It is the conversation with the son that is primary um, and upon which the continuing conversation with the people of God uh, is based. First then, but I want to look at the conversation with his people first. So we'll look first at God and his people. First, God continues to address his people today with the exhortation and warning that he spoke to his people of old. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Psalm 95, 7 through 11, from which, of course, that first quotation came, in Hebrews 3, 7 through 4, 11, and Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, and Hebrews 12, 4 through 11, are the two most prominent instances in which God continues to address his people today with the exhortations he used of old. The first is a warning against apostasy. The second, against the failure to persevere in the face of suffering. Deuteronomy 32, 35 and 36 in Hebrews 10, 30. Habakkuk 2, 3 and 4 in Hebrews 10, 36 and 38. And Haggai 2, 6 in Hebrews 12, 26 are additional examples of continuing divine exhortation. Finally, in Hebrews 13, 5, God promises his people what he wants to promise to Moses and Joshua. In Deuteronomy 31, 6 and other places, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then we, the people of God, are invited to respond with the words of Scripture to enter the conversation by using the affirmation of Psalm 118, 6 and 7. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can a human being do to me? These perpetual divine exhortations are reinforced by Old Testament examples of both faithfulness and disobedience. We must avoid the apostasy of the wilderness generation, Hebrews 3, 7 through 4, 11, and the godlessness of Esau, Hebrews 12, 14 through 17. But we are invited to emulate the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11, 1 through 40, and to take our place in this history of the faithful, both divine exhortation an Old Testament example to assume the continuity of the divine speaker and the human respondent. Now, God and his son. God, however, also has a conversation with his son. The words that God spoke to the Messiah in the Old Testament, he now speaks to the son. Furthermore, the son answers in the voice of the Old Testament faithful. The Father installs the eternal Son at his right hand as the all-sufficient Savior. The Son affirms the incarnate obedience by which he has obtained this place of authority. The divine word is the source of salvation, just as it was of creation. When we listen to this dialogue, to this conversation, we hear, or perhaps we should say overhear, God revealing himself in one who is Son. The first stage of this father-son conversation is found in Hebrews 1, 5 through 14, and 2, 11 through 13. The second in Hebrews 7, 1 through 25, and 10, 5 through 10. We can think of these stages as two acts in the drama of redemption. The first establishes the exaltation session of the incarnate son as sufficient savior. The second confirms the priestly nature of this session and the atoning effectiveness of his incarnate obedience. Let's examine the first. The father begins the conversation in Hebrews 1, 5 through 14 by addressing Psalm 2, 7, 2 Samuel 7, 14, Psalms 45, Psalm 45, 6 and 7, Psalm 102, 
25 through 27, and Psalm 110, 1 to the Son on the occasion of his exaltation in session. The Father calls him, my Son, in Psalm 2, 7, God, in Psalm 45, 6, and 7, and finally, Lord, in Psalm 102, 25 through 27. He affirms the sovereign rule of the Son through Psalm 45 and describes him as the one who has both created the universe and will bring it to its intended end in Psalm 102. The Father's speech reaches a climax in Psalm 110.1 with the invitation for the Son to take his seat at the Father's right hand. Thus God addresses the Son in terms that affirm his eternal deity, exaltation, and session at the Father's right, right hand. The Son responds in Hebrews 2.11-13 through 13 by addressing Psalm 22.22, 22, Isaiah 8.17, Isaiah 8.18, and 2 Samuel 22, 3, to the Father. In his answer, he consistently affirms his identity with the people of God. He uses Psalm 22, 22 to praise God before his brothers and sisters at his exaltation. He voices his incarnate dependence in Isaiah 8, 17, 2 Samuel 22, 3, I will put my trust in him. And his full identity with the children of God has given... God has given him in Isaiah 8, 18. The father invites him to his right hand. The son affirms the humiliation through which he went in order to accept the father's invitation. Let's pair the father's declarations in Hebrews 1, 5 through 14 with the son's confessions in Hebrews 2, 11 through 13. First, God affirms that the son enters the fulfillment of his sonship at the exaltation. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. I shall be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The son responds to this proclamation of his sonship. I will announce your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. God then affirms the son's deity and sovereign rulership. He is not only son, but he is God. The son answers, I will put my trust in him. Then God issues the invitation, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a stool for your feet. The son answers, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. I will accept this invitation for myself and for my family. Hebrews opens with Act 1 of this father-son conversation. Act 2 comes in, in Hebrews 7, 1 through 10, 18. The heart of this sermon, the exposition of Christ's high priesthood. The God who invited the Son to his right hand in Psalm 110.1 addresses him as the ultimate priest in Psalm 110.4. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This session is a priestly session. It is a session of one who is fully sufficient to cleanse God's people from sin and bring them into God's presence. The Son answers in Psalm 40. Hebrews 10, 5 through 10. A body you have prepared for me. I have come. I have assumed this humanity to do your will, O God. He has entered into that effective priesthood through his incarnate obedience culminating in the cross. Thus the Father's declarations to the Son concern the climax of his saving work at the exaltation when he enters his vocation as all-sufficient Savior, the Son's answers focus on his incarnation as the way of becoming that Savior. Hebrews also shows how the description of the old sacrificial system in the Pentateuch provided a background or provides a background for this conversation by disclosing the inadequacy and typological nature of the Aaronic priesthood. I don't have time in this paper to pursue that line. Now, the relationship between these two conversations, they're interrelated. The conversation between the Father and the Son, which we overhear, brings new urgency to the conversation between God and His people that is addressed to us. The fulfillment brought and announced by the first of these conversations, the Son is the complete Savior at God's right hand, makes obedience, our obedience to the second all the more imperative, God's people must attend even more carefully to his word than did his people of old because they live in the today 
of fulfillment. If it, if it were, was important for those that heard God at Sinai to obey, it is even more urgent that those who hear him speak the great salvation now brought in Christ through the exalted Son do not refuse the one who is speaking. Characteristic two, we have the immediacy of God's word in Hebrews spoken by God in these two conversations, but Hebrews focuses on the exalted one seated at God's right hand. Since the father-son conversation focuses on the son's exaltation session, it leads us directly to the second prominent characteristic of Hebrews. Hebrews does not focus on the pre-existence or the incarnate son, on the pre-existent or the incarnate son. Hebrews focuses on the exalted son seated at God's right hand. At every crucial point throughout this book, the author directs his hearer's attention to the exalted son. We'll review some of those crucial points. The first thing Hebrews says about the son is that God has made him the heir of all things. God's having established him as heir is as much an accomplished fact as God's having spoken, having spoken through him and as God's having made the worlds by him. God has made the son heir at his session. The prologue concludes with he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The Old Testament quotations in chapter 1 reach their climax in Psalm 110.1. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The discourse on Christ's high priesthood, which makes up the central part of this book, begins with, we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens in Hebrews 4.14. At the center of this discourse, the author declares that his, this exalted high priest is the main point of his book. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. This discourse about Christ's high priesthood comes to a conclusion with, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. At the heart of the author's concluding appeal for faithful perseverance, uh, he urges his hearers. Look, this is in chapters 11 and 12, beginning somewhat in 10, you have this grand final appeal for faithfulness, for perseverance. Right at the center of that, at the beginning of chapter 12, at the, at the very heart of it, the writer says, look to Jesus, the pioneer and per perfecter of the way of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It is only after the sustained focus on the exalted son in Hebrews 1, 1 to 14, that the author turns to the incarnation through which the son attained exaltation in Hebrews 2, 5 through 18. And that is just what the incarnation was, Christ's incarnation, obedience, and self-offering, or the necessary path for him to become the exalted son, per permanently, eternally, and perennially seated at God's right hand. When the writer of Hebrews refers to the one seated at God's right hand, he is referring to all that the Son is and has become through his salvific work. The eternal, pre-incarnate, incarnate, obedient, self-offering, now exalted and seated at God's right hand. Sometimes you'll find scholars of Hebrews that try to separate. This is the exalted Son, not the pre-incarnate Son. That's alien to Hebrews. When Hebrews talks about the exalted Son at God's right hand, it's everything that Son is, uh, is included in that. Thus, all titles and descriptions can be applied to the exalted son. He is the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He is a great high priest passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. He's a great priest over the house of God. He is the pioneer and perfecter of the way of faith, Jesus. The author emphasizes the exalted seated son because he is the all-sufficient savior. The author directs his hearer's attention to the exalted seated son because he is the one who can enable them, enable them to persevere by cleansing them from sin and bringing them into God's presence. Now let's look at some implications of these conversations and of what I've been saying. What are the implications of Hebrews' emphasis on the contemporaneity of God's word 
and the exalted Son seated at God's right hand. We evangelicals have consistently and rightly affirmed that God has revealed himself in history and in particular in the incarnation of his Son. The seventh and eighth of Carl Henry's 15 theses, which take almost as many volumes, no, not quite, uh, address these issues. The author of Hebrews would agree. He believes unequivocally in the incarnation, obedience, suffering, self-offering, resurrection, and exaltation of the Son. He has not replaced the resurrection, but included it within the exaltation. That's another discussion I don't have time to pursue here, but I think that's true. However, the pastor who wrote Hebrews would insist that the Son enters into the fullness of his vocation as sole and all-sufficient Savior and as the ultimate revelation of God only when he has taken his seat at God's right hand on God's throne. The writer of Hebrews does not focus on the exaltation and session per se. He focuses on the exalted Son of God, now seated at God's right hand, completely able to save. The great salvation which the Son provides is not separable from his person. It was only when he had been made perfect through the incarnation, self-offering, and exaltation and session that he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. His people receive the benefits of this salvation by drawing near to God through him as part of the household of God over which he rules as son. Their salvation is not based simply on something that he did in the past. It is based on the one who he now is. They have no salvation apart from their union with the Savior. Now we're in a position to discover the reason for Hebrews' confidence in the contemporary relevance of God's Word. God's Word is contemporary. because it is fulfilled in and describes a contemporary reality. The all-sufficient Savior seated at the Father's right hand in the place of ultimate authority. The Father-Son scriptural conversation that we discussed above finds its fulfillment in Him at the Father's right hand. God's Old Testament exhortations to His people, people take on a new contemporary urgency because of Him. It is the one seated at God's right hand who brings all the types of the old covenant order to fulfillment. Furthermore, Hebrews itself and the rest of the New Testament writings continue to have authority and relevance because they describe him. Thus the son now seated at God's right hand is the secret of scripture's contemporaneity because he fulfills the Old Testament and is attested by the new. Some conclusions. Recognition that the Son who continues to sit at the Father's right hand is the source of Scripture's unity and contemporary relevance provides an objective basis for that relevance. It has implications for the topics upon which we preach, the way we do historical study, and the way we seek to apply biblical teaching today. First, an objective basis for contemporary relevance. We often ground the contemporary relevance of Scripture in pneumatology, sometimes even in anthropology. Human nature hasn't changed, so it still addresses us today. But the Scripture is relevant all, in, in terms of pneumatology. The Scripture is relevant because the Spirit who inspired it continues to enlighten us as to its meaning and guide us into its truth. The fact that Scripture is fulfilled in and describes the present reality of the Son of God at the Father's right hand provides a second Christological and more objective foundation for Scripture's coherence and continuing relevance. The Spirit of God can bear witness to no one but the Son of God, seated at God's right hand, as described by Scripture. Thus, this objective reality provides a restraint on those who would appeal to the Spirit as the one leading the church to adopt theological or ethical positions contrary to plain biblical teaching. We are not dealing so much with an outmoded text but with the contemporary reality of the exalted Christ, the subject of our preaching. Our preaching will focus then on the incarnate, obedient, now exalted Son of God at God's right hand. We'll be anxious that people persevere in faith and obedience by embracing this full, fully sufficient Savior as anxious as was the author of Hebrews. Hebrews. 
We will not artificially force our texts into an alien mold, but we will consider each text in relation to the fulfillment he has brought. Whatever areas of our individual or common life we address, we will address it in light of his sufficiency and of the urgency that sufficiency creates. A proper focus on him will help to purge our sermons from the secular wisdom of popular culture and help to deliver us from preaching merely our own opinions and will remind us of our own accountability before the present living reality of the exalted Son of God. Our study of the ancient context, recognizing that the Son seated at the Father's right hand is a contemporary reality, will it also influence the way we examine the ancient context of Scripture. We will have little interest in hypothetical sources or speculative reconstructions of particular biblical books' origin. We will re resist the temptation to explain Scripture away by reducing it to a network of contemporary influences, contemporary with the scripture itself. We'll study the literary form, historical background, and language of a book as a whole in order to understand what it is saying so that we can understand its truth in light of the present reality of the exalted Son of God. Our contemporary, fourth, our contemporary application. Finally, this contemporary reality guides our application if biblical language describes the present reality of the exalted Christ, then we must take care before relativizing the significance of this language, lest we distort our perception of the reality it describes. It is one thing to study the historical background of a passage with the purpose of applying it appropriately in an analogous contemporary situation. It's quite another thing to study historical cultural background with the goal of explaining away the plain teaching of the biblical text because of its inferiority to contemporary insights. We cannot, for instance, reduce the language of priesthood and sacrifice that we find in a book like Hebrews to something else without distorting our understanding of the present reality it describes. We are called to enter into it, into, into, into that language, to the reality it describes rather than to recast it in terms of a different conceptuality. Our study of Scripture's contemporary relevance has brought us to Christ, the complete Christ, the exalted Christ at God's right hand, the all-sufficient Christ, who alone has secured an eternal redemption and is thus able to purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. God continues, the God who spoke and has spoken, continues to speak what he spoke and has spoken through him. So we end with the exhortation of Hebrews in chapter 12. Do not refuse the one who is speaking. Thank you.